From the News Channel 5 Network, this is Open Mind. Good evening to you and welcome to Open Line. Thank you for joining us. I'm Carrie Sharp. My first show of the year with you here on Open Line. So happy new year to you. I hope you'll be part of the show tonight and call in. We're talking about the state of education as a lot of students start the second semester uh, of this school year and the new one for 2022. We have Beth Brown joining us, the president of the Tennessee Education Association. Beth, thank you for being with us once again. Well, hi, Carrie. It's good to be back. <laughs> Gosh, we have talked so much about education over the last really, I guess, three years when you look at school years because we've been dealing with COVID during that time. Uh, it's become just really the, the reigning topic of conversation in schools and with parents and even students. And I want to look back starting at uh, this past semester that teachers and students just went through of this school year. And something different for this school year with COVID was the governor's mandate to not to go to remote learning learning except in really um, emergency situations with it. I don't think anything in the mid state has qualified for that. I don't know about statewide, but I wonder uh, what you have have learned across the state, how that has gone in this first semester of the school year. Sure. Well, thanks for the question. And, and as you stated, we are in our third academic year uh, of the pandemic. Uh, we don't hear words like unprecedented and novel anymore because unfortunately, this has become the norm. Um, as I reflect on the last two and a half years as we have been dealing um, with the COVID-19 pandemic, we've learned a lot um, about the virus itself. We've learned a lot about our ability to um, live during a pandemic and educate during a pandemic. <clears throat> One of the things that we continue to struggle with though are all of these new variants. Um, you know, last spring as, as more and more people were getting vaccinated, um, there was a, a general sense of hope in the spring and summer that as we approach the 21-22 academic year that um, things were gonna get back to what we considered normal. Mm -hmm. um, and then the Delta variant hit and it hit with a vengeance and we saw um, students being infected in a way that we had not previously. Um, we saw uh, districts, quite frankly, unable to keep their school buildings and school districts in operation. And, and we saw a timber as after schools had opened for a few weeks, um, and the infection was uh, spreading, we saw more and more educators having to go into quarantine for either infection or, or exposure. And, and districts didn't have enough staff. And we're not just talking about classroom teachers, uh, we're talking about our paraprofessionals, our bus drivers, our cafeteria workers, our teacher's aides. We literally did not have enough um, adult bodies in the buildings to continue to provide in-person instruction. And so we saw a number of districts across the state uh, back in the early fall semester, having to move to remote instruction for several days. Um, fortunately, the Delta variant kind of died down and, and things were able to um, continue a little more safely in person. But uh, at the end of the semester, educators and students alike were tired. But what I heard from educators across the state is um, that this is the hardest year of their profession ever. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that was, that was kind of a, an aha moment because I think everyone thought that last year would be the hardest year. And to, to with the one notable exception, every educator that I've spoken to this academic year says that this is the hardest year they've ever had. They went into the Christmas break or the holiday break rather, um, very tired um, and, and very, um, down Do you think that's because this is just drug on for so long and we have gotten our hopes up that we could return to normal? Why is that? Why has this been the hardest year? So I think that the, the answer is twofold, Carrie. I think, yes, there is pandemic fatigue, absolutely. Um, <laughs> when, when we went into the pandemic, I think everyone thought, oh, this will be a couple weeks, mm -hmm. it'll be over. 
here we are into academic year three, calendar year three. Um, so there is very much a, a sense of, of real pandemic fatigue. But the other, the other contributing factor is that we have such an educator shortage um, in our state. It's an educator shortage that has been building for years, but that has only been um, exacerbated. It's been quickened um, and made much, much worse by the pandemic. We've had folks leaving the profession um, for a variety of reasons, a lot of, of which are pandemic related. And, and so educators are being asked to do way above and beyond, mm -hmm. um, you know, to, to cover for their colleagues, to do extra duties um, and not having anything taken off their plate. And so when you combine that with pandemic fatigue and then and dealing with their own families, it's, it's, it's a lot. It is a juggling act for sure. I wanna pause our conversation and get to Matthew. We always appreciate when people call in and are part of the show. Matthew, thank you for being with us. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, um, um, I was just wondering uh, with the uh, situation with charter schools becoming a good option, uh, what is actually the total cost here in Nashville uh, to put a child through a full year of education, I guess through K through 12 and uh, let's go Brandon. Are you talking about putting them through public school or putting them through a charter school? Ooh, getting a lot of feedback there. So Beth, I'm gonna let you take that and see what you heard from that. Um, maybe you understand this question a little bit better, more thoroughly. I think the question is um, about the cost, the, what it takes to educate a student in, mm -hmm. in the national public school district. Um, I, I can't answer that for a variety of reasons. First of all, um, I'm not sure if he's talking about private charter schools or public charter schools because the funding is going to be different. Um, and the other thing is every district in our state um, spends different amounts of money on uh, on educating their students and since i'm a, uh, the president of a statewide organization i can't speak to specific national numbers off the top of my head okay matthew i feel like your question was maybe getting towards something else so if you want to call back in and maybe get to that we can do that so go ahead and give us a call number is on the bottom of the screen if you have questions about what's happening in our education system across the state this is the night to call in 615-737 plus is the number to call uh, Beth, I wanted to kind of circle back to this first semester, and it was my understanding that the governor said no remote learning except in the most extenuating circumstances, um, which, again, I said I, I didn't think that had happened here in the mid-state. We at least had not reported on it to my knowledge. You were saying that remote learning has taken place. Um, I know in Wilson County, like Wilson County shut down for a week, but there was no remote learning in, during the fall. Uh, what is your understanding of what's happened? Yes, yeah, so you're not incorrect. There, there were a couple of things that happened. There was a lot of confusion um, at the beginning of the year because there was legislation passed, um, and there, there, there was um, uh, the governor did say we are not going to allow um, districts to move to remote learning. What districts can do is they can apply for a waiver to the commissioner of education to move. Um, individual sites, oh, so individual right. school buildings or um, particular classrooms or hallways to remote instruction if they can um, can prove that there is a sufficient need. But to, to move an entire district to remote instruction is currently not permissible by law. And so what you saw in Williamson County and in other dis districts across the state, they simply did not have the staff system-wide um, mm -hmm. to to keep their schools open and so what they wound up having to do was use inclement weather days and what's really unfortunate about that Carrie is that um, we sent students home to do no learning you know if, if, if remote instruction had been an option there could have at least been some learning going on and what what we saw was with the inclement weather days there was absolutely no instruction being provided yeah, weigh that for me, uh, because so much has been said about remote learning. Was it helpful? Was it not? Was it more of a headache for teachers? Was it not? Did it work? You know, overall, that's question. Did it work? Was it worth it? Um, tell me a little bit about how you see that debate. Well, I think it's it's like with much of the pandemic, as as time has gone on, has gone gone on, and we have learned more about the virus and more about. 
um, its impact on students and educators' physical well-being as well as their mental health. Um, you, you know, you change your perceptions. I will say something that the Tennessee Education Association has said since day one is the health, safety, and well-being of our Tennessee students and educators has to be the top priority. And as we were um, dealing with the pandemic before any um, vaccines were available, before we had stronger uh, mitigation strategies, uh, we definitely supported districts ability to make the decision to move to remote instruction when infection levels in their communities indicated the need. We have seen the long-term impact of that uh, and so as we, we weigh the um, the impact on students' uh, mental, emotional, and social well-being and their academic well-being um, and, and understanding that we have some mitigation strategies that were unavailable at the onset of the pandemic. I think that there's general consensus um, that in-person instruction is what's best and, and educators have said since day one that's absolutely the best thing for our students. It's what we want to do um, at the beginning of the pandemic we made decisions to keep our students healthy um, in as much as possible. And so now that we have mitigation strategies that we didn't have available before, I think that there's a real commitment among educators to provide in-person instruction as much as possible. Okay, we're gonna take a quick break. When we come back, we'd love to take some of your calls about the state of education in Tennessee. And we'll also be talking about the upcoming legislative session that starts tomorrow. Stay with us.